unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant the Masha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Bishop. Leaders come and go, but institutions stay forever. This is the central takeaway of a new book by Subhashish Badra, Cage Tiger, How Too Much Government is Holding Indians Back. Subhashish is an economist whose career has straddled both the policy and the corporate worlds. He's worked at a leading global management consulting firm, a venture capital firm, and a tech startup, working closely with CEOs, entrepreneurs, bureaucrats, politicians, and academics throughout his career. His new book is a call to action that encourages Indians to move beyond their fixation with leaders and focus instead on building strong state institutions. While discussions of state capacity are typically the stuff of academic conference rooms and think tank seminars, Bader believes they should be at the core of everyday discussions Indians have on the future of their democracy. To talk more about this book, Shubhashish joins me today from Bangalore. Shubhashish, congrats on the book and thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much, Milan, and pleasure to be here. So I want to start by asking you to rewind the clock uh, to about two years ago uh, and the start of the pandemic, which is where you start your book. And uh, one of the things you say early on, and I just want to quote here, you write, better institutions would not have prevented the pandemic or completely eliminated the unfathomable human suffering it caused. However, they would have made Indians' lives better during these tough times, end quote. And, And, you know, in much of the public commentary, when we review pandemic performance, we talk about leaders, right? Whether it's Trump, Modi, Boris Johnson, Bolsonaro. What do you think the institutional story is that we're underselling? So, Milan, clearly the the story of institutions and individuals is far older than just the pandemic. But I think the pandemic really brought it to the fore. In many countries, including ours, the pandemic almost became like a referendum on the leader. Uh, So whether it be at a central level or the referendum on Mr. Modi's capabilities or at the state level, be it Amamta Banerjee or Anuttav Thakre, um, the entire media narrative was focused singularly on each of these leaders and how their personalities or what the values associated with them were dictating the pandemic response. However, the argument that I make is that Things go much deeper that in focusing so much on individuals, we perhaps forget the institutions that enable them or constrain them from behaving the way they would like to. So to pick a couple of examples, when the pandemic happened, uh, there was obviously a fiscal stimulus in different ways that was rolled out uh, for the Indian public. But whereas in the US, you have the purse strings that are held by the Congress and therefore there is some political negotiation happening between the presidency and the legislature. In India, because the legislature and the executive are joined at the hip, there was no such uh, negotiation that was happening. Another thing, for example, was obviously the pandemic called for extremely coercive measures in terms of um, in terms of physical distancing, etc. And while we see in many other countries, including France and others, that there was a bill that was introduced in Parliament, which clearly laid out what kind of restraints were required on movement. In India, we see colonial era laws that were used and modified in a way to bring about these coercive techniques. Uh, And finally, when we talk about criticism of the response of the government, we see in state after state that there were laws, there were threats, there were warnings that were issued to citizens to not criticize the government. Now, each of these three things, you could perhaps a talk about the person in power and say, hey, this is because of the sitting chief minister or prime minister. Or you can peel, start kind of peeling the onion and looking back at the institutions that enabled it, because we will encounter these kind of perhaps not as um, as as kind of violent for society as the pandemic, but we will encounter these kind of situations from time to time. And I think these institutions uh, will stay for us. So if we improve these institutions, obviously, it's not to say that countries with better institutions had no problem with the pandemic, even they did, but it gets us a step closer to it. So I think that's the shift in narrative from individuals to institutions that I'm trying to kind of pinpoint in this book. I mean, you talk early in the book about, you know, you have the story of independent India's, you know, largely successful journey, um, you know, depending on how you measure it. And, and that story is a complex interplay between individuals and leaders and institutions, right? 
But again, just going back to what you've just said, you, you sort of lament the fact that, you know, Indians have always focused far too much on the former while conveniently ignoring the latter. And tell us a little bit about the kind of motivation for writing this book. You know, what was it that happened? Was there a eureka moment that moved you to put pen to paper? So I was in my previous role interacting with a lot of people who were working on pub and writing on public institutions, on regulatory governance. And this was the first time, even as an economics student, someone who studied economics at the leading universities, both here and uh, in England. I, for me, this was an inflection point about how I personally viewed the world. And once I started applying that lens of institutions to things that I read in the headlines, things that I read in magazines, it was very difficult to look away. Every time I would read something, I would, I would start questioning, hey, what's the institution underlying that? Because I think that enables us to really understand things much better. But at the same time, because my entire journey has been in the corporate world, I have spent time in management consulting, venture capital, etc. Um, and I realized that even though my peers in Gen Z and among Gen Z and millennials, while they cared about these issues, they weren't necessarily talking about the kind of deeper aspects of it. They weren't talking about the institutions that were underlying it, or they weren't even talking policy. They were talking personalities. And I thought, therefore, with all this fantastic work that was happening in the academic circles um, and coming out in certain books, to translate that into the language, into the cultural context, into the vocabulary of Gen Z and millennials was something that I was I felt someone had to do. Uh, and because I had a lot of time in the middle of the pandemic, I thought it might as well be me. Uh, so that was the origin of this book. So you write that there are three central flaws in Indian democracy. And I'm wondering if you could kind of elaborate on each of the three, right? So first, you note that laws in India are written in a way that delegate way too much power to governments. That's the first flaw. The second flaw is the functioning of government itself is mired in opacity. It's, it's, it's hardly transparent. And the third flaw is that laws and implementation don't really amount to very much if there's no independent oversight mechanism to hold governments accountable. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of illustrate your thinking on these three aspects of a new democracy for us. Absolutely. So to start with, I mean, while I call them flaws, I do think that at the time of independence, they were much needed to hold the country together. But over time, uh, any country obviously has to evolve in, in reaction to the requirements of that, uh, of that time period. And I don't think we've done a very good job of doing that, which therefore has caused those three features uh, at the time of independence to become flaws as of today. The three that I speak about, as you rightly said, is A, excessive delegation. Obviously, any act of parliament delegates a lot of authority to governments of the day to go about their business. However, the challenge that we have is that A, both the mechanics and the vocabulary of that delegation in India is broken down in severe ways. We will see, for example, across many laws, you know, be it in terms of regulating internet or uh, people's freedom of mobility, we see words like public, um, with public order, public emergency, etc., be there in law after law. And these terms have neither been clearly defined in regulation or in the judiciary. So we have the situation where while the government is allowed to do a whole bunch of things in the name of public order and public emergency, it's not clear what constitutes public order. For example, are people who are rioting on the street in response to something, is that public order or breakdown of public order? Or the threat that people might do that, is that, a break, is that breakdown of public order? So while when these things are not defined, that gives a lot of room to whoever is building these laws and executing them to do what they want to do. Now, the second challenge is, irrespective of what the laws are, the challenge in India is even if you write good laws or decently good laws, there's no way to know whether they're being implemented. And a classic case of that is in terms of telephonic surveillance. So while the Supreme Court came in and said in the, in the mid-1990s that every time you do telephonic surveillance, these are the procedures you must follow, Nobody has any idea whether that's actually happening or not. Uh, so apparently there are some, uh, in the mid-2010s, there was some research which said that there were 300 such surveillance orders that are passed just by the central home ministry in a day. And the oversight committee that reviews this meets once in two weeks, which means by the time they meet, there are thousands of cases that they have to look at. And these are obviously busy bureaucrats, so are they even doing it? Uh, and the government has obviously also blocked some of the RTI queries that people have raised. So there's no way to understand that even when there are some guardrails, are those being implemented or not? 
And finally, even if that kind of transparency existed, unless there's someone who can actually go and hold the government accountable, it doesn't work. Typically, that's the judiciary. And then we see in some laws where the role of the judiciary has been reduced as well. So, for example, uh, when uh, books are banned under certain customs laws, the person whose book is banned cannot actually go to court against it, which means that the government has a free reign to be able to do what they want to do. So therefore, these are features that we see, whether it be economic regulations, whether it be social regulations, whether it be political structures, we see some variant of these three flaws in all of them. And my argument is that therefore, unless we fix it, we will stay in a situation where we aren't really the most effective government that we can be. You know, what's interesting is when you talk about the Constitution, you you quote the lawyer Gautam Bhatia, right, who has argued that, look, 75% of the Constitution is based on the 1935 Government of India Act. But uh, at its soul, the Constitution sought to be a transformative one in which um, it, it wanted to embed, the, you know, the principles of, of liberty, equality, fraternity uh, into the, the kind of spirit of newly independent India. Um, but one of the things you imply while, while referring to this is, look, the, the, this idea of a transformative constitution also helped to create or justify a kind of suffocating superstructure in some sense, right? So do you think that result was kind of inevitable given the aims of what the founders set out to do with this constitution, which was, you know, you had a political revolution, of course, which was democracy and freedom from the Raj, but they also wanted to affect a social revolution. Absolutely. So I think given the context of that time, given the economic stagnation we had just seen, given the desire to reform society and get rid of casteism, and given the desire to keep the country together in a very chaotic time, I do think that the measures that the constitution makers took were justified and they were acutely aware of that. So we have that um, image of uh, Patel going after the constitution is, uh, is adopted and saying that here's the first preventive detention law and I've had many sleepless nights before introducing it. So they were obviously acutely aware of what they were doing. Uh, Ambedkar called for a government that was even stronger than the British government. So we, un we know that they understood what they were getting into. And given the context of that time, very much necessary. So I do think the expansive Indian government was by design and not by malice or without deliberation. However, where we have perhaps got it somewhat wrong is that when you start empowering the state, unless you empower society at the same time, that's when kind of liberties and democracy and even prosperity really go off the rails. I do not think our constitution makers built enough checks and balances that enabled society to be able to at least question, constrain, or deal with that stronger state. What do I mean by that? For example, the couple of ways in which society can be strengthened is A, obviously having information to be able to hold someone accountable, and secondly, to have the political voice and the political channels to be able to do that. So the time that our constitution makers were strengthening the state or were retaining that, uh, that state that the British had created, I think they could have done a lot more in terms of bringing a lot more transparency. Maybe if, if they believe that, hey, transparency upfront holds us back, at least post facto transparency. Uh, and secondly, the political representation, the way that it has broken down over the years because of the anti-defection law and other such regulations is also something that we possibly could have avoided. So yes, very much required, but because democracy, liberties, prosperity is a tango between state and society, I think they kind of, the way we have evolved has perhaps left society somewhat behind in terms of strengthening it. So let me just push you a little bit on this, because, you know, one of the things that you talk about in your book, and it's it's a, something that I thought about a, a lot as well, but I don't have great answers to, which is, you know, you think about the British colonial heritage, right, and a law like the 1861 Police Act, right, which which really wasn't meant to offer a model of community policing. It was a way for uh, a colonial enterprise to control their subjects, right, to provide order in, in that kind of settlement. And over the years, uh, uh, the Great Britain has reformed their laws. They have changed models. They have changed laws. They have transformed their policing structure to something that looks very, very different than what existed in 1861. Yet here we have independent India having thrown off the shackles, understandably may have decided for expediency to adopt a similar model because it had to run a state in the middle of all of this 
um, you know, chaos and disturbance um, and questions about, you know, independent India. But but here we are 75 years later. And, you know, as you document, despite the intervention of civil society, courts, citizens, former police officers, things don't look that different. Um What's your sense of why India hasn't been able to take on some of these things that its colonial master has been able to? So I think a couple of things. Firstly, uh, at some level, we're still a very recent republic. Uh, So we might be an old civilization, but we've only been here around for like 70, 80 years in this particular legal framework. And so I cut ourselves a little bit of slack that these things obviously very often become worse before they become better. A second reason could potentially be that as an extremely poor country, the first order of priority things that you need to solve are the Ruti Kapra Magan issues or the basic essentials of life. After that, we perhaps get to higher order questions. And obviously, India has also got there fairly quickly. The fact that we are having a marriage equality debate, which is playing out in the media, I think is testament to how quickly we have moved on certain things. Because our fundamental challenge is one of centralization, is one of political representation that has broken somewhere uh, because of this political parties in the ways they operate, I think it's a lot more difficult here to make that voice heard. You need something that's really major. You need something that builds up over time. All of this to say that I do think because of all of these factors, because there is an existing power center, which has all the incentives to not change the system, in fact, make the system even more uh, difficult uh, for people to operate, the only way this changes really persistent and long-term effort, effort, and once this becomes a political issue, I think the challenge is that this has just not been, this has not become as much of a political issue. Nobody's kind of mobilized as much around it. We have seen uh, where mobilization happens around the RTI, et cetera, that over time things perhaps get a little bit better. Uh, and that kind of political issue hasn't been made out of police reforms just as yet. And in this kind of a setup, the ability of the Supreme Court also to impose certain changes is limited because I think in India, horizontal accountability structures have become somewhat weaker. So the only way this changes is that as we start mobilizing around different issues, that we create more of a environment where we can start winning back some of these reforms. You, you know, just thinking about the kind of size and the scope of the state, I found your comments on social welfare to be really interesting, right? Because you, you, what you're arguing essentially is like, look, you can be left, you can be right, you can be progressive, you can be conservative. Everyone can agree that India needs some kind of new social contract with it's citizens who are on the economically weaker end of the spectrum, right? And if you if you think about that argument in the current context, you know, I, I think what the Modi government would say is we're building that social contract, right? We've created a framework. Uh, you take Aadhaar, you take digital payments, you take mobile banking that have facilitated together direct benefit transfers to people's bank accounts. Alongside that, I think the government would say we've made big investments in infrastructure, uh, whether it's you know sanitation, roads, electricity, water, um, those investments have been at the local level, but we've also tried to connect India through a system of highways, roads, ports, et cetera. Right? We've all seen the statistics about India's you know massive investments in in, in capital investment. Do you think that this constitutes the basis of a new social contract, or do you have something different in your mind when you say that? I would tend to agree that I think we have taken several steps towards it, and this is an argument that uh, Arvind Subramaniam also makes in one of his recent articles, which is through this entire set of direct G2P payments or G2P benefits, we are starting to mimic Uh, a universal basic income, uh, which many people argue is that new social contract, which is that you shouldn't be so interventionist, just give people money and let them know what to do with it. And we have seen it in state level elections as well. Our policies are increasingly becoming more and more general, less targeted, etc. So I think we are moving uh, towards that. And at some point, perhaps there might be an inflection point and we kind of put all of those together. There are two challenges, however. A, I think is because of the entire patronage system that has been built around some of these price interventions over the several decades that they have been in place, I don't think we've undone it. We have not undone it, perhaps because it's not too difficult to undo it. Uh, There's too much path dependency, as we found in the MSP system, or perhaps because there's such a system of uh, corruption that is built around these systems that, you know, financially people are going to get hurt and there's a patronage system built around it which perhaps at some point gets into politics as well. So that is the one challenge which is 
the whole purpose of this new social contract should be to replace the existing social contract, which is somewhat broken. And I don't think that is doing it. It's in almost in addition uh, to the old social contract. The second is that the basis of any welfareism is that public goods should be provided by the government because they have these externalities. And the risk that we run is in the presence of this new paradigm towards social welfare, is there a risk that we are ignoring the older or more classic public goods? So, for example, as we roll out uh, insurance systems for uh, for healthcare, where the government is coming in and paying or subsidizing those premiums, is there a risk that we move the political will away from improving healthcare and improving hospitals towards actually just providing uh, money and therefore let it, then letting them go and uh, go and get services private hospitals there is a reason uh, that we have public schools and public health care the challenge is we take the easier path we take the mission mode path and we actually ignore the path that uh, that has uh, greater benefits for people so i think these are the two challenges that i would outline with the new paradigm of social welfare Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. Uh, look, can I just push you on, on, on the second part of that, which is, you know, I, I agree with you completely that, you know, as Arvind puts it, the focus has been on the public distribution of private goods rather than the public distribution of public goods like health and education and so on. You know, uh, some people have pointed to the Ahmadmi Party experiment, what they've done in Delhi, perhaps what they may do in Punjab in terms of, you know, focusing more on health and education, which are things that entire communities will benefit from if they prosper, not just select targeted communities. Do you think that um, this is moving the needle? Do you see the discourse changing where, you know, maybe five years from now or 10 years from now, politicians will be forced to campaign on the basis of public goods promises as opposed to here's something that I can give to you in your household, which I could also take away. I absolutely think so, because these become extremely emotive issues for people, right? A child's education, uh, care for the elderly, etc. And I think the way, to give credit to the Ahmadmi Party, the way they have really trans not only done whatever they have done and if election results are to be believed and doing it well, but they've actually made it an emotive political issue and you have to kind of give them credit for that. Just like perhaps six or seven years earlier, uh, Mr. Modi had come in and made corruption and dynasticism uh, very emotive political issues in a way that now they've almost become the mainstream. So I do think these narratives will keep getting added and as we see these examples of things that become political issues, uh, I think we have a greater chance of then them uh, reaching the mainstream. You know, I want to just ask you a little bit uh, on a slightly different subject on this question of state versus market, right? Which is something that uh, is, is, is a kind of tension throughout the book that you talk about, you know, um, a lot of books on reform in India tend to offer very full-throated uh, uh, pans to free markets. You have a bit more of a cautious note, right? And, and I just want to read uh, what you've written, which is based on a kind of analogy of a car driving down the highway, where you say, free markets generate high sustained growth in the long run, but that governments need to intervene smartly and effectively to ensure that the car doesn't skid off the road. In India, governments have often chosen to drive the car themselves, and when they don't drive it, to control the accelerator and brake while nominally handing over the steering wheel to the private sector, end quote, right? Which is a very nice way of packaging this. Um, how do we think about the striking the right balance here, right? I mean, obviously, what you are saying is there needs to be greater free choice. There needs to be a greater role for individual rights. There needs to be more role for entrepreneurship. But at the same time, um, it's not necessarily a question of cutting the state out, but perhaps reshaping its role. Is that an accurate way of putting it? Absolutely. Um, as a precursor to my answer, I would again reiterate that the transitions that we saw perhaps in the early 1990s and since then has been from a centrally planned to a regulatory driven um, society and our regulators, which is why I devote an entire chapter in the book to them, do have an overbearing presence in our economy. 
given that so much special on the economic front is driven by these regulators, I go back to answer your question about the sequencing between state and markets to the article, uh, to a paper written by Justice Sri Krishna and a whole bunch of others, which was around building regulatory capacity. And how do you think about state capacity vis-a-vis markets? And the summary that I took away from that paper was you think of it as a set of iterative measures. If you try to do too much uh, with an understaffed government, with not adequate training, not adequate resources, etc., you're bound to fail. And the reaction to failure, unfortunately, isn't to do less, but it is to use blunt policy tools. So when the Supreme Court realizes that, hey, we can't regulate alcoholism on roads, we are going to just ban it for 500 meters from highways. And similarly, if we can't control the kind of um, the kind of uh, kind of Diwali crackers that we manufacture, we're going to ban them altogether or whatever, right? So we start using these blunt tools to achieve state objectives, and that's not good either. Therefore, in that paper, what it argues is you start with a smaller rule, you get good at doing that smaller rule, and then you start adding to state capacity. So it's almost like a step-by-step. Your state capacity and your regulatory aspirations have to match with each other. To give an example, we now have, are discussing a data protection authority and we, just like any other regulator, think of some fancy building where some bureaucrats will be sitting and regulating all of the internet. And that, I think, is a recipe for disaster. You perhaps first narrow down some of the harms, try to regulate those, get better at regulating those, and then start thinking that, hey, I will regulate the entire internet. Because in trying to regulate the entire internet, A, we are probably going to do a shoddy job. We are going to create a lot of uncertainty but for entrepreneurs for regulators, etc., and therefore just have a very low-level equilibrium. So in response to this question of state and markets, having now worked in the private sector for a very long time, I think the thing I like to say most frequently is that what scares the entrepreneur the most is uncertainty in regulation. It is that the government will come one day or the regulator will come one day and completely illegitimize your business model. I don't think anyone has a problem with regulation. They have a problem with badly executed or formulated regulation. One of the things when you talk about the role and powers of the state is the question of of, of surveillance, right? And kind of uh, privacy data protection. I mean, this is a nice segue from talking about the data protection bill. And many people who are on the liberal end of the spectrum have raised questions about mass surveillance in India and whether the country is, you know, knowingly or not, putting into place a system that has a lot of Chinese characteristics, right, uh, in, in the world's largest democracy. These voices can often be drowned out by those who call them Cassandras or Luddites or alarmists, naysayers, right, or what have you. But do you think we should be paying more attention to those who are urging caution as we put into place these new kind of high-tech tools? Absolutely. I do think that we underestimate the risks that some of these systems are creating. To be fair, surveillance is obviously not, nothing new, apparently, when back in the day when people had to do riots, they would look at voters' list, which would give them everyone's religions and addresses, and they could really execute their function or what they were trying to do to a great degree of accuracy. The challenge now is that now this is just becoming digitized. When things were manual, there was a lot of friction in the system. So, for example, if you had to do telephonic surveillance, someone had to sit at the back end and go through all those hours and hours of conversation to figure out what was interesting. But now suddenly, if you can just replace it with AI, which is going to catch the key words, you can do telephonic surveillance in a way that was never, never possible before. And on this whole question of surveillance, even people on the right, they might argue that, hey, look, this is required for national security and this is what is going to keep us safe. And they have very good arguments to do so. But I would ask two questions or two prompts that can perhaps help us try to get to some sort of convergence. One is that, for example, when we do telephonic surveillance, do we have data on how many of these surveilled individual tapes were actually presented in court as evidence? Unless we know that, we don't know how off are we are. Are 90% of these tapes ending up in court or are only 0.1% ending up in court? So we need to know that. Secondly, and I go back to a right-wing icon, which is Shama Prasad Mukherjee, when after the First Amendment, he said that perhaps your government is going to stay in power forever and these are good things for you, but at some point, someone's going to come and replace it. So even if you believe that this present dispensation has the best interest of India at its mind when it is doing all of this, we can't assume that there will not be 
a more corrosive dispensation that will come about in the future. Yeah, I mean, especially in a place like India, right, where where there's a, a inevitably political surprises around every corner. I, I want to maybe transition this conversation, Subhash, just to talking a little bit about solutions, right, which is something that you two focus on towards the end of your book. And, you know, one of the things you do when you're discussing how ordinary people can be brought into improving government performance is you introduce this phrase, which I've never heard of before, called sortition. Um, and I'm wondering if you could explain it to us a little bit. You know, what does it mean? Where does it come from? And how is it applicable to what's going on in India? Or what should happen in India? I hadn't heard of sortition either, which is in the, uh, in the context of researching for the book that Pat Shah, who was then at CCS, introduced me to it, and I thought this was a very interesting and provocative way to think about political representation. Uh, sortition is fairly simple. It says that instead of us having these elections where you go and vote and you decide whether you're presidential or uh, first past the post or proportionate representation, etc., you actually just draw lots. So whoever wants to be in public office or in legislature can say, hey, look, I want to be in that legislature. Our names get put on a lot and we draw lots and that's how we select people. And I thought intuitively that there are lots of interesting elements in that. A, obviously, we don't have, we avoid the spending on elections, which A, the government does, but also, especially as you have uh, documented very well, is that there's an entire ecosystem and so much spending happening outside of that. Uh, B, because these people now know that their re-election chances are not dependent on them um, do behaving a certain way, I think they're able to take somewhat more independent decisions. Um C, uh, because our existing political system, uh, because of its focus on elections and costs associated, has essentially become unequal, uh, that richer people have far easier chances of getting elected to power. This, I think, um, challenges that dynamic that all of us genuinely have an equal chance at being elected, which takes care of the other side of, of democracy. And I thought that was a very interesting idea. Some people might say, hey, drawing of lots just sounds like a ridiculous idea. But I do think it is time that we think about some elements where this might be useful. So, for example, should parliament uh, become some, some kind of a body that is drawn through the process of sortition, whereas we then move, perhaps move to an executive presidency. Is that a better system than where we are today? Or should one of the houses of parliament become one that is drawn from sortition? I think there are a lot of challenges in the existing parliamentary system that sortition does hold the promise of resolving. And I'm not saying, I'm not at all an advocate that we should move in that direction. But my limited point is that we should think about these alternative forms. Uh, sortition obviously hasn't ever worked at scale or hasn't even been tried at scale. It's been tried in small Greek republics. But perhaps it is time for us to think about whether this might be something that fixes some of the challenges that we have seen with the Indian parliamentary system. I mean, you know, just thinking about citizens' role uh, more generally, right, you reflect a bit on citizens' movements towards the end of the book, and and, and you argue that, look, like any social force, they have real limitations, but they do remain an important integral part of institutional change, particularly when you're operating in a large democracy like India. So, you know, for those of our listeners who are out there who are perhaps more of an activist bent of mind, what role do you see citizens' movements playing in, in, in trying to bring about greater government accountability? So I think there are a couple of ways of citizens to get involved in these movements. The one argument I make throughout all of this is let's not be dismissive towards what we call armchair activists. That even a tweet goes a fairly long way, that you build a certain narrative on social media. And because governments are now so sensitive to social media, some things happen. It might be something as small in the grand scheme of things as the whole issue around the TCS and the tax collected on source on the international credit cards, where the government responded essentially within a few days. Or it might be something as consequential as free basics and net neutrality. So I think, A, activism through social media and through your armchair is not actually a bad thing. Uh, the Anna Hazare movement, for example, really utilized this whole missed call concept to very great effect. But more importantly, uh, in a democracy, when people actually show up on the street, uh, they are able to negotiate those political discussions with governments in a much more effective manner. RTI, for example, the Right to Information Act, was one of those few rare moments of the government actually giving away power to the citizens. And that came about through decades and decades of consistent effort and, you know, taking this issue into the villages, making it part of the popular vocabulary, songs, dances, etc. So you build a movement around that. 
I was writing this book at the time that the CAA and NRC movements were at its peak, and one might argue, sure, that you know there was no major rollback of it, but in even pushing it out and putting it on the back burner for a certain amount of time, I think those movements achieved certain things. So, in any kind of um, gov- democratic setup, especially one where we're seeing that the ability of the legislature and the judiciary to hold the executive accountable at either the state or the central level is weakening. We will encounter a situation as a country that the primary mode of accountability will become citizens directly, and either we create channels for them to participate in policy making, or we will have elements of it then show up on social media and on the streets. I mean, what's interesting about your arguments, Abash, is it is it kind of cuts against the grain in a sense because you know one of the standard kind of parlor room cocktail conversations about India is it has such a hard time getting stuff done, right? And you often see these people who are non-Indians you know, lament, if it could only be a little bit more like China in terms of, you know, pushing through infrastructure, ramming through reforms, liberalization, so on and so forth. Um, uh, that's a wrong-headed view in your opinion. I mean, I at least the view that I take is that we should, especially in the country of India, size and diversity, we need to have these, speed breakers on the way. The speed breakers obviously reduce our ability to do good, uh, but they also reduce our ability to do bad as as a country. Um, And at the end of the day, the route to prosperity will be around for several generations and several decades to come. Uh, If we try to change too much too fast, we possibly expose or radical change. We try to, we expose ourselves to things really going wrong in many ways. So I know there are lots of people who in 2014 jumped onto the bandwagon of saying less or bought into it, which is less government and more, uh, less government, more governance. But at some level, they're kind of starting to regret that. And we've seen across other kind of political dispensations as well, that some kind of buyer's remorse. That's a challenge with radical change that, you know, you also end up um, in places you perhaps don't want to be. Therefore, I'm a great votary of evolutionary change that I believe that the kind of institutions that we create it becomes our legacy to the next generations, becomes our legacy for the longer-term health of India. If, if, the, if the British have been at this for some 800, 900 years, if the Americans have been at this for over 300 years, I think the least we do uh, is to be somewhat more patient about these things. You know, it's funny. It reminds me of the arguments around coalition politics versus single-party majority governments, right? So there's a book by Irfan Nuruddin about coalition dharma. And basically the argument is that, you know, when you've had coalitions in India, you've actually had better economic performance because although it may be hard to start new initiatives, it's also harder to roll back some old ones, right? So you had a series of quite um, uh, 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 unwieldy coalition governments during the 90s and 2000s, but that in fact kind of locked in some of the progress towards liberalization, you know, and and it was harder for governments to do big things that may have... uh, have created a lot of disruption, like a demonetization, for instance, right? Which is something you can really only do when you're a single party majority because you don't have to bring anyone else along with you. Absolutely. And I think what we in India achieve under coalition governments is no trivial thing. So the decision to, for example, go for the nuclear test under the BJP government and then dealing with the fallout of that very systematically is something we achieved then. We've also achieved certain um, things like RTI and Manrega. So as much of criticism as the Manrega now gets, it still exists, which means it serves some purpose. So I think we did some very monumental stuff under coalition governments, and I do not share the dismissiveness uh, towards coalition governments. At the same time, I do recognize that as a country, I think we are attracted towards this notion of power, uh, towards this notion of decisiveness, uh, which is why even before Mr. Modi came on the scene, the most popular prime minister happened to be Indira Gandhi because she was seen as the kind of this decisive leader. Um, and that's, again, the transition that I hope, uh, you know, with this book and obviously the wider literature within which it sits can start provoking some of our younger generations to think about things slightly more differently and uh, being somewhat discerning uh, about the narratives that build up in, in mainstream politics. So, so let's end with a question about the younger generation and uh, who are interested in just kind of changing this to status quo, right? You, you talk at the very end of the book about the need, need to build a quote-unquote starter kit for Indians who want to see change, who want to see reform, right? So for young Indians who are out there maybe listening to this show, 
what to your mind belongs in that starter kit? What are the tools that you that you believe belong um, in, in that uh, armory? So I talk about typically four elements of the starter kit. Uh, the first element is honestly just to educate yourself. Uh, this book was my effort both to educate others, but also educate myself in the research process. But there's so much great thinking that people have read. Uh, whether your interest be in the economic aspects and the social or the political aspects, there's just so much rich thinking and writing that people have done, uh, books that people have written. So I think the first step is to educate yourself. The second is to communicate, uh, which is let's start talking about these issues because there's a lot of self-censorship that happens in this group uh, where people say, hey, look, I don't want to talk politics. So I think young India has to get rid of its aversion to talking politics and talk politics in ways and in words that most resonate with them. With this book, for example, it was the first time I made an Instagram read because I thought that's a good way to perhaps communicate. And uh, I think a lot of people and a lot of organizations have done that well and need to do even more of it. The third element is to agitate. Uh, I think in many young people are just somewhat skeptical about showing up at a political protest. And I think across the political spectrum, there's at least lip service and encouragement that is given to participating in protests of different kinds. So if not physically, then protest digitally. There's enough things that we don't feel happy about. If we don't voice it, I think we're doing as much of a disservice to our political leaders as anything else. And finally, and most importantly, that the structures of formal institutions are built on the foundations and the edifice of informal institutions, which is culture. So unless we have a culture which promotes speech, when we are willing to tolerate free speech that uh, someone who doesn't agree with us is talking about, unless we do that, I don't think we are getting to formal institutions which are then set up to protect free speech. I think over time, your in the formal institutions catch up with your informal institutions, good or bad. So I think it's really important for us to start living the values that we are espousing and encouraging others to live those values as well. So that's the four-part starter kit uh, for Gen Z and millennials, which is educate, communicate, uh, agitate, and um, I forget the fourth one. <laughs> Uh, my guest on the show this week is the economist Shubhashish Badra. He's the author of Cage Tiger, How Too Much Government is Holding Indians Back. Everyone interested in rebuilding the Indian dream should read this book. That's what the economist Ajay Shah had to say about this book. Uh, Shubhashish, thank you so much for putting this together. I think it's uh, it's amazing how you're trying to reach a new audience um, who may not be aware of this literature on institutions and individuals and economics and development. Um, but I think it'll be a reference for some time to come. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for that. Grant Abasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we reference on this week's episode, visit our website, granthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Nithya Lab. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Isabel Villegas is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production, brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.